socio-political reality. What do you mean by that? Well, of course, that's where I start getting uncomfortable and shifting in the chair because I'm a scientist and it's not my business to tell people about the socio-political situation. But the reality is that uh, climate change or more strictly global warming ceased to be a scientific issue at least 10 years ago and it has now become a political issue of the highest order. And when you look at the way the politics of that is being handled, it's a complex um, issue, but the big green non-governmental organisations are part of it on the world scale. And in individual countries such as New Zealand, the green political parties are part of it. Uh, and people's fears have been aroused to the point that all major political parties, be they nomin nominally left-wing or nominally right-wing, are forced or have been forced by public opinion to acknowledge this threat. So the socio-political reality is that if you look at the science, as I said earlier, the scientific reality, and it says there's no danger of out of control global warming at the moment, if anything, there's a danger of cooling, it's not easy for a politician to get up and even say that because they will be buried in criticism. So, the, And that's the socio-political reality, that it's very difficult for governments to handle because you can't actually have an intelligent discussion about the science without getting enveloped with the politics of the special interest groups. Do you think the news media has been fair to its uh, reading and viewing public in the way it has uh, portrayed this whole climate change stroke global warming debate? There are some honourable exceptions to what I'm going to say, and what I'm going to say is no, the news media in general have handled this issue very badly. There are, however, a number of newspapers internationally uh, which have presented in a balanced fashion uh, both sides of the story. The Wall Street Journal is one of the outstanding ones. The British uh, Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph is a second, and the Australian Rupert Murdoch's paper in Australia is a third. Uh, that's in the printed media. If you look in the television and radio media, it's very, very hard to find any station which is not basically um, pushing the global warming barrow. Uh, there is a lack of intelligent, balanced commentary on this issue in the media, yes. Professor Carter contributes regularly to public education and debate on scientific issues. His public commentaries draw on his knowledge of the scientific literature and a personal publication record of more than a hundred scientific papers. Professor Carter strives to provide critical and dispassionate analysis based upon scientific principles, demonstrated facts and knowledge of the scientific literature. Bob is also an enthusiastic and valued and a foundation member of the Australian Environment Foundation and a very good friend. I would like to welcome Bob uh, here today to speak on global warming, in particular an analysis of the facts of climate change in a balanced context. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you to Max and the AEF particularly for the invitation to speak to you. A few things I'd like to make clear at the outset. Uh, I'm as much in favour of looking after our planet and the environment as apparently John Newcomb wishes to appear to be. I'm not, however, in favour of squandering precious wealth on futile feel-goodery like the Kyoto Protocol especially given what Chris has already referred to, which is the fact that several billion people on the planet still lack clean drinking water, adequate sanitation and cheap power. Like most climate rationalists, I'm called a climate sceptic. I'm not a sceptic except in the sense I'm a scientist. All scientists are sceptics. I'm actually an agnostic about global warming, a human caused global warming. I have no axe to grind. Let the facts fall where they may. The third point in introduction, science is not about consensus. Science is about testing hypotheses. The hypothesis of the day that we've already started to test by Chris is that human carbon dioxide emissions are causing dangerous climate change. That's the hypothesis that's in the newspaper every day. Note this is not a hypothesis about pollution. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. It's not about sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, particulate carbon and so on. They're all things we should worry about and deal with. The global warming hypothesis we're testing is not about pollution. And fourthly and lastly, the public debate is bedeviled by a lack of context and a lack of balance. And I'm going to address both those points in this talk, um, and I'm going to test that hypothesis interwoven throughout the talk. 
So I'd like to start by asking a question, is, is it warming or not? And I look at them and I say, it depends. <laughs> they look back at you and they think, you smart ass. I'm not in the least being clever. Profoundly, it depends. Here's what it depends on. This is data from ice cores in Greenland for the last 50... Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to get used to this. For the last 15,000 years. So here's 16,000 years ago here. This is the last ice age. Here we are today, modern time here. And the red curve is temperature measured from those ice cores. And you see it was significantly colder than today back here. Uh, and then it's warming up until about 10,000 years ago. And about 10,000 years ago, we embark on this period of time which geologists call the Holocene, where broadly it's about the same temperature as today. So the question is, is global warming happening? Well, let's stick a line through there, and there it is from 16,000 years ago. It's warming since 16,000 years BP. I think the warmers are right. If you fit that line, it's warming for the last 16,000 years. Not a very sensible line to fit. So let's fit the line now between uh, the last 10,000 years, the, the warm period we live in called the Holocene. And surprise, surprise, it's cooling. So for 10,000 years, it's been cooling. Well, Mr. Howard's focused on a slightly shorter period of time than 10,000 years, so you wouldn't get anywhere talking to him about that. So let's come down to the last 2,000 years, the, the Christian era, this little box in here, which I've exploded up. And we'll fit a line, and lo and behold, it's still cooling, and it's cooling at a faster rate. Hmm. Well, 2,000 years, that's still too long. So let's take the last 700 years. It's called the Little Ice Age because... We see here it warmed and cooled and warmed again. This is the period we call the one no change at all. Stasis since 700 years ago. And now we get to what the warmers want us to get to. Look at that going up like a rocket. We were right. Global warming's happening. But Chris showed us this. There's a little bit of a problem. If we go to the last 10 years, sorry, the last 8 years, it's stasis again like the Little Ice Age. There's another problem, which is... If we uh, look at all those lines, they're statistically significant except for lines 5 and 6. Why are 5 and 6 not statistical? Because they're too short a period of time over the data set. There's plenty of places where the temperature's going up at this rate, back here, back here, back here. This is absolutely not unusual. So, answer it yourself. You've got the newspaper report now. He says to you, is warming happening or not? It depends. So now we've just uh, looked at the last 16,000 years. Now let's reduce that for a moment to the last 5,000 uh, 5, years. And we've plotted it in BC and AD, in Christian period. The green stripe is the modern late 20th century warm period. You see temperature does indeed warm here. And these data are the same ice core data we've just seen exploded up a bit. But we also see there's this warm period here called the medieval warm period. And lo and behold, all the green stripes are previous warm periods. There's nothing unusual about the late 20th century warm period. You hear it said, but it's bigger than it is, bigger change, more warmer today than in the last thousand years. Well, the first answer to that is, so what? What's so special about a thousand years? It's a, a blink of an eye in geological climatic terms. But the second more important answer is that if you look back to several thousand years, which is the minimum period you need, uh, you see here these warmer periods regularly spaced and you also see that the last three of them, the previous three, are all warmer than the modern period. There's nothing, absolutely nothing unusual about the magnitude of, of temperature on the planet today. Furthermore, if we recall through these beautiful paintings, amongst other things, European paintings, that between the warm periods, we have these cold periods. This is the little ice age I've already referred to before. If you think that global warming might be damaging, and I believe I have heard a faint rumor some people think it might be, then you want to try global cooling. This will wipe out the granary crops of the world if it happens again, and it will happen again, it's only a matter of when, and the solar physicists right now are predicting we're probably, not probably, there is a good chance we are heading into another little ice age in the next 20 or 30 years. Did you read that in the Melbourne Age yesterday? Okay, well, so we looked at 20,000 years worth, we looked, narrowed that down at 5,000 years worth. Now as a geologist I can start to relax because we're going to look at a reasonable period of time. And here it is, we're going back now almost half a million years, 400,000 years. 
And here's our modern Holocene warm period. And you'll note that today's here, and just a few thousand years ago, it was a degree or so, here's the scale, it was a degree or so warmer than today. Well, climatologists used to call that the Holocene climatic optimum. Nice place to be. You know, wonderful, polar bears loved it and all that. You can't use that word now, it's disappeared from the vocabulary. Couldn't possibly be a climatic optimum because it's warmer than today. Warm equals bad. If I was to take a book, the room at the end, on the way out, looking at that graph now, 400,000 years of Earth history, here's the little warm periods, the rest of it, 90% of the time, it was colder than today, and mostly much colder. What's going to happen next? How many people would give me a bet on the way out of the room it's going to get warmer next? Not one of you. Because it's not going to get warmer next, it's going to get colder. It's not a matter of if again, it's a matter of when. That's a very difficult question to answer, but it's certainly going to happen. Okay, well, you've um, heard it said that the polar bears are going to die out as the temperature goes up another degree or two. Well, have another look at this slide. Uh, this, um, sorry, this, this peak up here is five degrees warmer than today in this interglacial a few hundred thousand years ago. You know those pictures you see on SBS and ABC? You don't watch SBS and ABC, do you? <laughs> God. But if you do, every week regularly you'll see a picture of a polar bear on ice floe somewhere or other. They're imaginary. They're virtual reality. They can't be there. They couldn't possibly be. Look, they all died out. They died out here. They died out there. There's none there today. Well, even 400,000 years is a pretty small period of time. And John just really gets comfortable when he's dealing with these millions of years. And Chris showed us a slide that went back hundreds of millions. I'll be more conservative and just come back six million years. Here's our temperature curve again, this time not from ice cores, but from deep sea cores. This is the research I personally work on. And you see these great glacial, interglacial fluctuations that we looked at four of in the last 400,000 years. That little box is the slide we've just looked at. And what you see is that even the warmer interglacial periods are several degrees cooler, here it is, 10 degrees, roughly, than the planet was in this period of time from three and a half million years ago and older. Yet every week I read some idiot biologist in the newspaper telling me the biodiversity of the planet is going to be destroyed by another temperature rise of a degree or two. It is complete nonsense, and it mostly comes, again, from computer models. The planet biota we have today grew up with and is adapted, firstly, in its genetic inheritance, firstly, to temperatures that are on average warmer than today, secondly, by God, you'd better believe they're adapted to climate change, because look what they've just been through. They can cope with rapid climate change. And thirdly, they're adapted to a world which, on the whole, was about three degrees warmer than it is today. So that's magnitude of climate change. Is there anything unusual about the magnitude of modern climate change, late 20th century? No, none whatsoever. Ah, Bob, you're forgetting the rate. It's not the magnitude, it's not the height of the peak, it's the scaling up the side. The rate is unusual, is it? Same data from the ice cores. I promise you this is the most difficult graph, except perhaps one I'm going to show you today. Please concentrate, it's important. What's plotted is the rate of change of temperature in degrees per 100 years, degrees per century. If we go back into the Ice Age here, we see that the rate of temperature change was as high as almost 15 degrees. That's 1.5 degrees per decade. Sometimes it cooled, warmed, sometimes it cooled. Well, of course, we don't live in this sort of a time, and we don't want to again, though ultimately we'll have to. We live in this sort of a time, and you can see that the rate of change is less. But it's still significant. Here are the two constraining lines. In, in that box in the last 5,000 years, there are the two lines that constrain the variation. And the rate is, on average, between plus and minus 2.5 and degrees per century. So the obvious question is, using the best available satellite data, what is the rate today? Here's the satellite graph from 1979 through to 2005. And yes, if we wish, we can fit 
a line. And lo and behold, the line says on average it's warming at about one and a half degrees per century. Is that unusual? No. It's right within the geological envelope of change, and it just happens to be warming, it could just as easily have been cooling. Furthermore, what about this peak up here? That's the 1998 El Nino peak. I'm nothing to do with greenhouse gas, yet that peak is to a very large degree, together with these two peaks, pulling the right hand end of the line up. These two troughs, which are due to volcanic eruptions, are pulling the left hand end of the line down. And as Chris has already said, a much more reasonable interpretation of this set of data is in fact that there's no change over that period of time except perhaps for a slight step shift across the 1998 El Nino. So, climate is not changing, either in rate or in magnitude, in any way unusual in the late 20th century. And notice the late 20th century phase of warming. There's no warming in the 21st century. We've had stasis for the last eight years. At the same time, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by 4%. The hypothesis is increases in carbon dioxide will cause dangerous global warming. The hypothesis is tested by that data set and it fails the test. Yet still it pops up back in the paper every other day. OK. Well, it just happens that in the last few weeks, the IPCC and the traditional global warming alarmist uh, um, campaign has taken a number of severe torpedo hits. Any one of them is enough to go right back to the drawing board. And I started with a picture on my title slide of a Salvador Dali painting. I forgot to say that being a professional scientist at the moment is like living right inside a Salvador Dali painting. You are surrounded by these exquisitely detailed scientific interpretations done by scientists who are fellows of the Royal Academy, leading scientists in the world, and they're nearly all imaginary. The real data tells you there is no problem at the moment. That's not to say there mightn't be a problem, we shouldn't think about it, but there is no empirical data for the greenhouse hypothesis being true, the dangerous one. And if you test it against the sort of data I've just given you, it fails, that test and many others. So I'm going to share with you now a few of these torpedoes. Here's the first one, and I'm proud to say it comes from our own Houses of Parliament. We have a, a Member of Parliament for Western Australia called Dennis Jensen, and he was a minority member of a committee set up by the House to look at carbon sequestration. The committee was chaired by uh, Petro Giorgio, who, although a member of the Liberal Party, is nonetheless a global warming um, zealous or devotee. And so the report, which was on sequestration, wasn't to do with global warming at all. Uh, Giorgio insisted on having statements in it saying climate change was a big real problem. In which case, the scientist on the committee, Dennis Jensen, said, OK, then we're going to write a minority report. And this was his minority report, tabled a couple of weeks ago. We do not believe the evidence unequivocally supports the hypothesis of anthropogenic global warming. We view it as very disappointing that a committee on science innovation has put out, that misunderstands the nature of the scientific method. I can get much blunter than that. <laughs> climate change is a natural phenomenon, it's always been, but it's always will be. Whether human activities are disturbing climate in dangerous ways has yet to be proven. Now those are absolutely accurate, scientifically sober statements. They're made by, it happens to be, the only qualified scientist in our entire parliamentary system. This was the most important thing in the whole report. Most of the public statements that promote the dangerous human warming scare are made from a position of ignorance by political leaders, press commentators and celebrities who share the characteristics of a lack of scientific training, lack of an ability to differentiate between sound science and computer-based scaremongering. Well, this is a very important minority report. It follows a report of the House of Lords in England and several reports from the US Senate which have drawn the same conclusion. Three sovereign houses of parliament in three sophisticated scientific nations, Western nations, have concluded that the alarmist case does not stack up. You'd think this would be greeted with clapping your hands and well done, Dennis. You'd be joking. This, I might say, is the first torpedo. So here's what, sorry, people had to say. Jensen's wrong because 43 out of the 46 submissions said so. <laughs> Jensen's report is philosophical waffle. What planet are these government MPs on? Dr. Jenison is a dinosaur. 
Jensen Group is the Flat Earth Four. <laughs> Damn it, Vale is simply daffy. Well, we might, um, I won't say. <laughs> You're laughing. This is our sovereign power. We have one person in that parliament with the training and the ability to write an accurate report on climate change. He does so. This is the result. It's an absolute disgrace. Rule one, never discuss the science. Attack the man, repeat the mantra. Dangerous global warming is happening. I'm not surprised Tim Flannery isn't here today. <laughs> Here's torpedo number two. Roy Spencer and John Christie are very well known scientists because they have been deeply involved in processing and presenting to the scientific community the results of the satellite data for the last 20 years or so. They recently published a paper in the Geophysical Research Letters uh, where they observed these climatic phenomena in, which occur in the tropics. And what we're looking at here, time scale, 30 days before the peak of the event and 30 days after. So these are several week long events where you get warming phases and cooling phases and that causes heating, evaporation and rain. So these are major rainfall events that occur in the tropics. And they averaged nine of these and aligned them about the zero day. And what they found is, as the heating progresses, the low clouds in green increase because there's more evaporation, more water vapour, more clouds. And so initially do the high cirrus clouds made of ice. But shortly after the start of the event, the ice clouds decrease sharply in cirrus. Now, that cirrus cloud is trapping the infrared radiation that's going out to space. If you reduce the cirrus clouds, you let more radiation uh, out and the earth cools. So, this is a direct empirical, based on data, uh, demonstration of the validity of what uh, Dick Lindzen again uh, coined a name called the iris effect a few years ago. It's been strongly criticised by other climatologists uh, and one of the reasons is that good empirical proofs of it have not been forthcoming. Well, here is one. This is an enormous torpedo because if this same mechanism, if, occurs on an annual decadal scale, it will account for 75% of the warming that is predicted to occur by the alarmist computer models. Now, whether you believe those models or not is not the point. Even if their predictions are right, they don't take into account this mechanism. <coughs> okay, here's the third torpedo. Uh, Chris has shown this graph. It's the carbon dioxide curve. So as we increase carbon dioxide up to today's 280, uh, the temperature rises about six degrees of warming. Note that you get half of that, three degrees, for the first 20 ppm. It's a very effective greenhouse gas carbon dioxide when there's nothing there to begin with. But once you start stacking it up on top of that, then the curve levels off logarithmically, and for doubling from the pre-industrial level to doubling is about a degree or so of warming. And that's not controversial. So how is it then that when we go to the IPCC's predictions, which we have here, is their first assessment, second, third, and fourth assessment reports, that they are predicting um, is the uh, temperature, uh, anything between one and a half and about uh, four and a half degrees, and their latest estimate is this, a warming of three degrees uh, with error bars between two and four and a half. Now they get to that from one degree by considering the positive feedbacks, which is the water vapor, as Chris has already explained. If you get a little bit warmer because of the carbon dioxide warming, then you evaporate more water. That's an even more powerful greenhouse gas, so you get warmer still. That's true, in theory. But in the real world, other processes come into play, and they're mostly negative, particularly clouds. More water vapor, more clouds. They bounce the light back to space, the low clouds, so you get cooler. And the, the climate system is highly homeostatic. It is self-regulating in this sense. Take it away from it's more or less stable up and down jigging every day. It's not stable, in fact, but you know what I mean. Take it away from that, it will always tend to return. Okay, so against that background, you get the alarmist figures by invoking positive feedbacks and ignoring negative feedbacks. Um, uh, Stephen Schwartz, a very well-established climatologist, published a new paper where he's analysed, using empirical data again, um, the uh, amount of warming that we should get for a doubling of carbon dioxide, and here's his conclusion. He looks at the relationship between surface air temperature and ocean heat content, 
And he concludes that for a CO2 doubling, you'll get a degree of warming, which is right on the line of what that theoretical curve showed in the first place. In other words, the positive and the negative feedbacks balance each other out, more or less. Here I've plotted that, and you'll see that even the error bar, that only just overlaps with the error bar of the alarmist IPCC um, uh, estimate. So, torpedo number three is another devastating torpedo. There's no answer to this at the moment. This is good, sound, empirical science. It's not arm waving, it's not a computer model, it's empirical science. Okay, back in 1990, uh, sorry, back in 2006, I wrote an article in the newspaper, and scientists don't write headlines like that, but occasionally you get a sub editor who is brilliant, and in retrospect, I have to say that was a brilliant choice of headline. It generated something like 50 or 60,000 hits on the web around the world within two or three days. Most of those hits uh, were people rising up to say, Bob Carter, I don't know what he's talking about, he's ignored the El Nino, he's cherry picking, he's doing this, that, or the other, and it's stuff you can argue, but it was mostly petty. However, in amongst there, there was some really good, you know, world class criticism. Who cares what an unknown academic from a second rate university in a third rate country thinks? <laughs> Well, some first-rate academics and a first-rate research institution in a first-rate country, namely the Hadley Centre, which is the British Meteorological Office's research centre in the United Kingdom, have just come out in one of the world's leading, used to be leading science journals called Science. Its reputation is a bit in tatters now, as is nature's, over these sorts of papers. But anyway, here it is, published a couple of weeks ago, and these are the people that do the computer modeling. Our earlier models did not attempt to predict internally generated natural variables. What? <laughs> well, you all knew that. Yes, I didn't know that. I'm a scientist, but most of you didn't know that. All these computer models they generate, they don't actually take account of natural variation. They just plug in some basic mathematical equations, which are well established and which govern some of the phenomena we understand, and they generate these predictions in doing. Well, now, these people were amongst those that rose up and crucified me because I pointed out there'd been no warming since 1998. How long does this piece of string have to be? It was first five, six, seven, it's now eight years with no warming. And they deny it. They say, well, you can't look at anything over that short a period of time. That's well climate. <coughs> They've finally been forced to address it. So what do they do? Our system predicts internal variability will offset the anthropogenic global warming signal for the next few years. It's not warming now, is it? But you wait till 2015, is the next message. <laughs> so here's the graph. The, bl the black is the actual uh, elapsing of temperature. The yellow and the blue are two of their different model runs, and the uh, red is the error bars around them. And you will see that to some degree, if you've got a good imagination, uh, this black plateau in here where there's no warming, this is the big El Nino in 1998, that they've managed to reduce the rate of increase of these two curves across there, but of course wait until 2000, well, I mean really. It happens that there's just been another paper published, a very important paper by Cam and Tung, where they've shown that the relationship here, the two variables, are the total solar irradiance, the energy from the sun coming in at the top of the atmosphere, and the surface temperature of the Earth. And it turns out there's a bit of amplification and that we get this uh, pattern here where uh, on, these are 11-year um, uh, sunspot cycles that's tracking here, and here's the scale. So we're going from about minus 0.2 to plus 0.2. So we've got about a 0.4 degree being driven by solar variability, change in temperature. That's not in this model. There it is plotted on the model. I mean, how can you take these people seriously, let alone how can they get their papers published in Science and Nature? This is not science. It's PlayStation 4 stuff. <laughs> well, there's a gentleman that deserves a Nobel Prize, or a prize of some sort, Anthony Watts, who's a, a, an amateur... He's not an amateur, he's a weather forecaster in the States. And he looked at this, these 1,200 dots here, which are the weather stations across the states, and he, he remembered this photo he had, grandma gave him when he was young. And this is what some of these weather stations look like. And he thought, well, you know, I wonder what they look like. So he got a team of people together that go around, and the um, red spots here are the stations they've surveyed. And all this data is averaged into this U.S. temperature curve for the last 120 years or something. 
then that is one of the inputs into this global curve, which Chris has already shown you, increases up to 1940, decreases down to 1979, and increases again. So the basic data for this is coming from here. The US has the best climate observing stations in the world. Everybody agrees. This is the blue chip data. So Anthony Watts had a look at this, and this is what he found. The Global Observing Network, the heart and soul of the surface weather measurement, is a disaster. Urbanisation has placed many sites on hot black asphalt next to trash barrels, beside heat exhaust fans, and even attached to hot chimneys, and I think that means barbecues. This is American, remember? <laughs> well, there you go. I'm making it up. Watts is making it up. No, we're not. Here's a typical station. Furthermore, this is the University of Arizona, a pedigree institution maintained by the professionals. Here it is. Here's the official, tells you, official station. Sitting on Asheville. <laughs> Recently, they replaced the thermometer which was inside the Stevenson box with a more modern aspirated temperature sensor. That's mounted at the wrong height above the ground. It's 1.5 feet below the standard measuring level. I say again, this is a US government established pedigree site. Here's the curve, temperature curve, and you see it goes up here. Anyone want to guess? when this uh, change was made? There it is, 2001. <laughs> you think that's bad, look at this. These sensors were on top of the building to which these air conditioners are attached, and they were moved down to the ground a few years ago. And they're now right next to the exhaust fans of these air conditioners. Here's the, you want to guess when that happened? <laughs> Well, not only did it happen then, but it turns out that you're right to guess it happened then, but you're wrong to think that was what the cause was. Because it, the analysis of the data showed that most of the warming was in winter of this step here. And the air conditions weren't turned on. That's a big problem. Giant problem. So when you have a giant problem, you call in a giant to deal with it. Here he is. His name's Steve McIntyre. He's the dragon slayer of this nonsensical piece of propaganda called the hockey stick. Most people, having slain that giant and absorbed the amount of abuse he did over that, would have retired. Not Steve McIntyre. He had to think about that, sorry. He had to think about this up here. And he went back and looked at the data, which is always a good thing to do, and he discovered that at that time, because of preparation for the year 2000 computer scare, NASA, just by mistake, it wasn't sinister, restored, after they corrected their software for Y2K, they restored the wrong data stream, the raw data stream, rather than the process data stream, not only for this station, but for a number of other stations in the US network. Torpedo number six, and it's a big one. Here was the previous reconstruction of the US temperatures, and five out of the, the top ten temperatures in the last hundred years fell up here, with this one, 1995, being the warmest ever. When you correct for these mistakes, which uh, NASA have now done, you take 0.15 degrees centigrade off most of... Oh, God, I do apologise for this. You take 1.5 degrees centigrade off, off most of this part of the graph, you reduce it down here, and now the cluster of hot um, years is in the 1930s, not at the end of the 20th century at all. It's pretty embarrassing stuff. OK, here's our temperature curve again. Um, warming to 1940, cooling, warming. And the question is, is this warming in here largely due to the urban heat island effect that I've just shown you examples of? And virtually all experienced climatologists would say yes, it's just a degree of how much. But studies were done which claimed to show that this curve has been corrected for the urban heat island effect. Two of the key studies were by Jones, who is a British at the Climate Research Centre in Britain, published in Nature, and his co-author, uh, Wang, a Chinese gentleman, who published another paper in the same year in Geophysical Research Letters. These two papers said, and they are still relied upon today by the IPCC, the stations were selected on the basis of history. We chose those with few, if any, changes in instrumentation, location, or observation times. Well, they looked at 84 stations. For 49 of those, more than half, there is no historical record whatsoever. Nobody's got the faintest idea whether they've been moved or not, and most of them probably have. For the other 35 stations, uh, more than half of those have been moved two or three times. One of them has been moved five times. 
There is no possible way that the statement I read you just now, that they selected the stations which had the best history of not being mucked about to get their data from, could be true. Doug Keenan, a British statistician, has therefore recently, the essential point here is the quoted statements cannot be true, they could not be in error by accident, the statements are fabricated. In other words, he is saying this is fraudulent research. This research underpins the whole IPCC case that urban heat island effect does not um, affect that graph. Well, that was seven scientific torpedoes. When you get really desperate, you turn to economics. Now, this gentleman, William Nordhaus, is a very distinguished scholar at Yale. Uh, and he appears to believe that he can predict the costs to the world of global warming. He's, of course, wrong, but nonetheless, here's his estimate. He thinks it'll cost 22 trillion. And I'm giving you this in the context of two other gentlemen you've heard all about, which is Al Gore and, uh, uh, what's that, British farm? <laughs> Nicholas Stern, who have made the other estimates and told us we've got to stop the world, get off. Okay, so the cost of warming is 22 trillion. And whilst I think that's an absurd estimate, Nonetheless, everything that follows is internally consistent with that first figure. Stern's proposal for rapid deep cuts would save 15, uh, 13 billion and would actually cost 27 trillion, more than this. If you go to Al Gore's uh, proposal, you'll reduce the cost by 12 trillion, similar figure, but it'll cost you 34 trillion. Both proposals imply carbon taxes rising to about $300 per tonne. You know what they are at the moment. They're around 30 in Europe in the next two decades, and six to $800 per tonne by 2030. $700 carbon tax would increase the price of coal-fired electricity in the US by 150%, would impose a tax bill of $1.2 trillion on the US economy. This is torpedo number eight. This will not happen. You can't absorb torpedo after torpedo after torpedo without ultimately sinking. The astonishing thing is that I show you the figure of what should happen. What is actually happening is the Queen Mary, that is the IPCC, is continuing to stay and sail stately across the horizon, a side full of torpedo. There has never in human history been a greater disconnect between the basic science and what is going on at the moment in Sydney at APEC this year, a week, and is going to go on at United Nations conferences in Bali and New York. It is absolutely astonishing the disjunct between the politics and the socio-economics and the green agenda and the empirical mm. science. The assumption that prior to the Industrial Revolution the Earth had a stable climate is not even wrong. <coughs> Climates always change, it always will. There's nothing unusual about present day rates of change. Atmospheric CO2 is neither a pollutant nor is it the primary forcing agent for temperature change. In fact, carbon dioxide is a benefit for humankind. Try telling your teenage daughter that. <laughs> Attempting to stop climate change is an expensive act of utter futility. You might as well try and stop the clouds scudding across the sky. In fact, that's exactly what you're doing. The only sensible thing to do about climate change is to prepare for it. And the biggest scandal about the current global warming scam and it is a scam, is that it's taking our attention away from the real climate change problem. There is a real climate change problem. There's a threat of cooling as well as warming. Cooling may well already have started in that levelling off of the temperature curve we've seen. The solar physicists are predicting we're going to have a phase of cooling. It's not even being discussed at the highest scientific and bureaucratic and political levels because of all the frenzy about imaginary global warming. Thank you very much.